this video is a bit risky because I'm fairly certain most of you have already played with this commander, but I think it's important still to recognize that there are some people who don't want to buy her precon and might still want to pick her up via singles. And there's plenty of different ways we can build the commander, and if you've already bought this particular precon, I'm sure a lot of the things I'm going to mention in this deck may actually be upgrades that you've been considering for the deck anyway. So let's go ahead and talk about Disa the Restless, or as I like to call her, my boyfriend. Disa the Restless is a Jund commander who I have honestly fallen in love with. I adore what this particular girl is cooking. So I, full disclosure, was not really around for the era of Jundit out in modern, which is what the Deez of the Restless precon is primarily trying to emulate. So I don't have a huge attachment to the original game plan of the precon, which was make it feel like you're playing the modern Jund deck, but in Commander. I was a Jund player back when Jund was originally coined because I played tournaments back in Shards of Alara, and Jund with Bloodbraid Elf and all kinds of fun value shit was what I played back then as a kid. So let's talk about what I want to do with the core strategy of Disa. Her first effect is anytime a Lurgoyf permanent is put into the graveyard, we can then revitalize that card, just revive it on the board immediately. And anytime one of our creatures deals damage to a creature that or to a player, we can create a Tarmogoyf token. Now, what is a Tarmogoyf token? Put very simply, it's a token that has all the properties of a Tarmogoyf. That's all it is. Like, actually, if you give me just a second, I can look at the tokens that are in the deck to show you one of the more unique things about this deck, and that's that it has an actual Tarmogoyf token. This is one of the first tokens that, outside of being a copy of something, happens to have a mana cost because it wants to emulate every single thing that the Tarmogoyf token that the Tarmogoyf originally had, its mana cost, its power, its values, etc. Now, the Tarmogoyf itself has power and toughness equal to the number of card types in every player's graveyards, plus one. So if I've got an instant in my graveyard and my opponent has a land in their graveyard, this Tarmogoyf is getting plus two, plus two, making it a two, three. There's all kinds of silliness that happens as a result of this. Other players just playing the game naturally will end up lending favor to us. Other players having things like fetch lands or storm decks or anything that fills their graveyard up quickly will end up affecting us as well. Players playing corridor decks will end up benefiting us a ton. Players playing Mothman will end up benefiting us a ton. So what do we want to do with Disa the Restless? Well, we want to be able to discard lots of cards in hopes of getting Goifs into the graveyard, and we want to have a lot of evasive creatures that will punch our opponents in the face over and over again, spawning more Goifs. So first off, let's look at the evasive Goif friends that are in this deck, the cards that are going to spawn lots of little Tarmogoyfs on our board, beginning with Sky Scanner. This is a 1-1 one, one with flying that will draw us a card when it enters the battlefield, replacing itself, which is really good for us. After all, Jund decks are all about value, and since we can't really afford to put in a super stable draw engine at our price point, having cards that replace themselves is super important. Speaking of which, Fairy Dream Thief lets us surveil one when it touches the board, giving us super easy access to another Goyf in the grave if we are lucky. We can also exile it from our graveyard at any point to draw a card and lose a life, meaning like Skyscanner, it does replace itself. Then we have the Emerald Dragonfly, and this card is very interesting. So it's a 1-1 one, one that has the ability to let us pay two mana and give it first strike until end of turn. Now, why is that important? Well, if you look at Disa the Restless, the way her ability is worded, when one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create a Tarmogoyf token. Now, at first glance, that means we can get one Tarmogoyf a turn cycle, but players who are used to the rules of multiplayer understand that this means that when one or more creatures deal combat damage to each individual opponent, we can make a Tarmogoyf token, meaning that our upper threshold is three Tarmogoyfs a turn cycle, right? Well, not exactly. You see, that's where cards like Ebon Dragonfly come in. If 
during combat, we can have multiple instances of players getting hit at separate areas of the game, separate timings, then we can actually get more triggers of Disa. So, if an Emerald Dragonfly, a Fairy Dream Thief, and a Sky Scanner attack our, each of our opponents, we will spawn three Tarmogoyfs. But let's say, for instance, we have three Sky Scanners and three Emerald Dragonflies, and we pay into those Dragonflies, giving them First Strike. Now, the first thing that happens in combat is First Strike damage is assigned, spawning us three Tarmogoyf tokens. And then, in a separate time entirely, regular damage will be applied, spawning us three more Tarmogoyfs. This gives us massive advantage in terms of board presence. So we are going to be using cards that allow us to manipulate the first strike mechanic as much as possible. The reason cards like Emerald Dragonfly are so useful in a deck like this is because Emerald Dragonfly has modular first strike. We can, or modal first strike. We can turn it on and off at will. Skyship Stalker is another such card. It's a four mana dragon that we can pay one mana into to give it haste or give it first strike or give it fire breathing. So we can choose if we've got plenty of first strikers on the board to let Skyship Stalker attack on the normal combat layer. But if we need it to hit in the first strike area to double up on our Tarmogoyfs, then we can do that too. Speaking of normal first strikers, Gurmag Swiftwing is a flying first strike haste bat that can spawn Tarmogoyfs. Draina, Liberator of Malakir, has first strike and will give all of our other creatures who are attacking a 1-1 counter. Again, because first strike happens earlier in the combat phase, this means that all of our creatures will get a 1-1 counter after Draina deals damage, and then they will assign damage afterwards. Then we have Rankle, Master of Pranks, Flying Haste, and it's got a lot of abilities on it. Ones that let us draw cards, one that let us discard Tarmogoyfs, and stuff that lets us sacrifice creatures, all super important. Treetop Scout is also wonderful, as it is a one-mana creature that can't be blocked except by flyers. Zira Arian has the ability to draw us cards when we desperately need more cards in our hand, but otherwise is a 1-2 flyer that will get us goifs. Tormented Soul will also get us goifs, as it is unblockable, and Rankle and Torbran is another one of our flying first strikers, who's got a ton of abilities on him, like being able to make everybody sack a creature, uh, adding two extra damage to all of our other creatures during combat, or giving us, or everybody really, a treasure token. Plenty of things that we can get from there. And with 11 creatures that have evasive abilities, it'll be very easy for us to get stuff into our opponent's life. And with these creatures being almost split down the middle between ones with first strike and ones without first strike, it should be easy to get a nice mix on the board and get four, five, maybe even six Tarmogoyfs a turn with proper setup. But that's not everything. We also need to have plenty of Tarmogoyfs to use. So the first one I want to talk about is Changeling Outcast. This is an unblockable creature that can spawn more Tarmogoyfs, of course, while also being a Tarmogoyf in its own right. So if we discard this card via any reason with Disa on the board, we will, of course, spawn a new Tarmogoyf. Tarian, or spawn on the board. Tarian Mauler is also a Tarmogoyf for all intents and purposes. Mast Vandal is a Tarmogoyf for all intents and purposes, while also having the ability to blow up artifacts or enchantments. Kiaran Wanderer is also a Tarmogoyf that can gain flying, double strike, first strike, anything that happens to be in our graveyard. And then Grave Shifter is another changeling who happens to be a Tarmogoyf. He also gives us a little bit of graveyard recursion. But onto the actual Tarmogoyfs, Lurgoyf, gets power and toughness equal to the number of creatures in all graveyards. Necrogoyf gets power and toughness equal to the creature cards in all graveyards and forces people to discard cards. He's also got Madness, which can sometimes come into play. Polygoyf has Trample and Myriad, so whenever we swing with it, we'll spawn multiple Goyfs, and its power and toughness are equal to the number of card types in all graveyards, like the normal Tarmogoyf. Pyrogoyf is probably the linchpin of our deck strategy, as it will burn players or blow up creatures Creatures based on the power that it has anytime a Tarmogoyf touches the board. Tarmogoyf's nest can spawn Tarmogoyfs while also being a kindred enchantment, which is important because Tarmogoyf benefits from kindred as well. He cares about all super types of cards or all types of cards in general. So 
A Kindred Enchantment means this is two cards. A creature would be one type of card. An instant, a sorcery, an artifact, an enchantment, a battle. All of those are types of cards that Tarmogoyf will care about. Then we have Magnavore, a hasty goyf with power and toughness equal to the number of sorceries in all graveyards. Mortivore, whose power and toughness equal to the number of creature cards in all graveyards with a regenerate ability attached to him. We also want to make sure that our Tarmogoyfs can come onto the battlefield quickly and do their job. So we are running Samut the Tyrant Smasher in order to haste our goyfs. Samut is wonderful because it can grant power to our goyfs if we need it to it can give a scry if we need it to and because it is a planeswalker it will count towards the number of cards in our graveyard card types in our graveyard that tarma goyf cares about we have recursion in the form of bending of dominaria which allows us to mill cards and then get creatures from our graveyard back into our hand and then finally for anything that we might have milled through the graveyard we'll throw all of our lands from our graveyard back into our library when the mending of dominaria finishes while this will turn off our Tarmogoyfs for a little while, it will put us in a great position in terms of mana advantage, because our deck is running a lot of Feshing Lands, which will throw themselves to the graveyard. Mending of Dominaria is a great card, and I think it's perfectly reasonable to take the drawback of the card for its third ability to get its first two abilities. Then we have Buried Alive, which allows us to throw three creatures from our uh, deck into the graveyard. We're just going to pick three Tarmogoyfs, unless we have Conspiracy on the board, which will turn all of the creatures in our graveyard into the chosen type. So Conspiracy says creatures we control the chosen type, the same as true for creature spells we control, all of that other stuff. This will mean that Goyfs, or anything that is not a Goyf, will also be a Lurgoyf when it is in the graveyard. So we can have Conspiracy on the board, and then cast Buried Alive, and then get, say, Rankle and Torbran on the board, because it is now technically a Lurgoyf, because of what Conspiracy is doing for us. This card is super, super powerful, and I highly recommend running it if you are not already. That all said, that's basically most of what we're trying to do with the deck. We want to turn cards sideways, hit people a lot, and make sure that we are spawning plenty of Tarmogoyf tokens. But we do need to make sure that we are drawing cards for consistency, so let's get into that. We are running a 12 card draw engine for this deck because it is that important to get to our stuff, but also a lot of our cards do not allow us, unless our commander's on the board, to go card positive, so we are needing to add a little bit of redundancy. So let's start out with Rummaging Goblin. This allows us to discard a card to draw a card. In an ideal scenario, we discard one of our goifs and then draw a card. Mad Prophet is doing the same thing. Moira Scavenger is doing the same thing with the added ability to make us tokens and also being a death-touching blocker, which can come into play in a variety of scenarios. Electric Revelation allows us to discard a card to draw two cards, and it's got flashback, so we can use it twice. Thrill of Possibility lets us discard a card to draw a card. Faithless Looting draws us two cards, and then discards us two cards, again, with flashback available. Garrick's Pack Leader is probably the strongest draw engine our deck has. Whenever a creature with power three or greater, which is almost always going to be one of our Tarmogoyf tokens, hits the battlefield, we get to draw a card. This means that if Garrett's Pack Leader is on the board and we get the bare minimum of three Tarmogoyfs spawned with our commander, then Garrett's Pack Leader will draw us three cards during every single combat phase, which is a ridiculously powerful rate of return. Collector's Vault lets us draw a card, then discard a card, while also giving us a treasure token, which is super important since we have a five mana commander who can be a bit unwieldy to cast at times. Harmonize and Ambitious Cost give us the ability to draw three cards for four mana. Siphon Mine will draw three cards for four mana while also pushing people a little further into card debt. Then we have a battle in Invasion of Mercadia. This while also powering up a Tarmogoyf, allows us to discard a card and draw two cards. And on the backside, it is the Kyrian Flame Rite, which allows us to discard a card to create two 1-1 one, one blue and red elemental creature tokens with haste. Sometimes that's viable, sometimes that's necessary, but the most important part of it is it is a battle that can trigger our Tarmogoyfs to get a little bigger, while also being a wonderful draw piece in its own right. It's got the same rate of return as Thrill of Possibility, and that is A-OK -okay by me. But... 
we still need to make sure that our opponents can't win the game. So let's get into that. In keeping with the theme of this being a Tarmogoy focused deck, we do still want to have access to some battles. So let's go ahead and talk about Invasion of Olgortha, Olgrotha. This is one of the 12 pieces of targeted removal in the deck, and it allows us to deal three damage to any target and then gain three life. In a pinch, we can use this to win a game outright by just doming somebody for the last three damage. And dropping it on the board is neat because we do get access to Grandmother Ravi Sengir, who is a flying creature that can trigger our Tomagoifs as well. But in a lot of scenarios, it is a five mana card that's a little too expensive to play. So we might just discard it to get more powerful Goifs. Wreck and Rebuild is modal. It can either be a ramp spell or the, it has the ability to blow up an artifact or enchantment. And it's got flashback. So if we throw it to the grave, we can still cast it. Decimate can blow up an artifact, creature, enchantment, and land, which is amazing in a variety of scenarios. Return to Nature can blow up an artifact, enchantment, or get rid of a card in a graveyard. Mortality Spear can get rid of any non land permanent. Maelstrom Pulse can get rid of any non-land permanent as well. Putrefy can blow up any artifact or creature. A Braid can deal three damage to a creature or blow up an artifact. Nameless Inversion is another card with Kindred on it, so we can get something gone. Give it negative three toughness, giving us the ability to get rid of indestructible creatures while also being able to let this touch the grave and be a kindred card for our commander. Casualties of War allows us to choose one or more of any of these effects, blowing up an artifact, creature, enchantment, land, and or planeswalker. This can decimate an entire strategy. I love Casualties of War. Death Sprout can blow up a creature while also giving us a basic land in a pinch. So I, I hope you see some of our draw and some of our removal is also ramping us. This is because Deesa is so goddamn expensive. Binding of the Old Gods blows up a uh, non-land permanent. It also lets us get a forest out of our library and drop it on the board immediately. And then it gives us Death Touch, which is wonderful because we are such a combat heavy deck and having any form of evasion, anything that makes it more likely that people are not gonna block our stuff is great. Then we've got two board wipes. One is chain reaction, deal X damage to every creature where X is the number of creatures on the battlefield and necromantic selection, which allows us to revive one of the creatures. It blows up automatically. You should also note that necromantic selection has a fun timing quirk where it actually can yank a commander away from somebody, preventing them from having access to their commander for the entire game. The spell is far more nutty than how people play it, but it is expensive. So we gotta talk about how we're going to afford expensive cards. Now, unfortunately, one of the drawbacks of having a five mana commander is being able to afford playing her. And once people realize they need to kill her quickly, it's kind of hard to run the deck without having multiple ways of getting her out. It is, after all, one of the side effects of having a build around Commander, so we have to have good backup plans. Lots of Ramp is one of them, and being a combat-centric deck that will have board presence that can win the game even without our Commander is another way of closing out those games. But let's talk about our Ramp section before we get into anything else. This is Elvish Rejuvenator. It touches the board, we look at the top five cards of our library, drop a land from them onto the battlefield tapped, and then we're off to the races. Super easy, it's four cents, it's fantastic. Honored Heirloom, because <laughs> Rainbow Rock goes in every deck. Honored Heirloom gives us a mana of any color and also gives us access to Graveyard Fuckery. We can pay two and tap it to exile a card from a graveyard at instant speed. Now, a quick aside about Honored Heirloom, I will play defense for this card every single time because I've seen people in my comment section say how Honored Heirloom is such a bad card because you have to spend three mana, uh, six mana technically, to get rid of a car single card in a graveyard and that's a bad return on investment. And to that I say, every one of you is playing this card wrong. You see, the glory of Honored Heirloom is that it is modal. It is a mana rock most of the time, and only in the scenarios where it is necessary for it to be a removal piece do you treat it as one. You treat it as a three mana mana rock every other time, which, especially with a commander who costs five, is not that big of a deal. The correct way to use Honored Heirloom is not to tap it willy-nilly and get rid of a card from a graveyard as soon as you're scared of it. It's to respond to your opponent's reanimation spell. 
Let's say somebody's playing Marin of Clan Neltoth, and at the end of every end phase, they, or every one of their end phases, they get the ability to revive a card from the graveyard. So what do you do? You hold up three mana, and you let the Marin Clan Neltoth player understand you don't negotiate with terrorists. So every time they threaten to revive that whatever the hell they want to revive, you just tap the Honored Heirloom in two lands, and then suddenly the Marin deck has turned off because Marin is a build-around commander who loses to this 7 cent, 8 cent. I'm sorry, I must have affected the price a little bit. This 8 cent common. Honored Heirloom is a fantastic card, and it can stop billions of strategies that revolve around graveyards, which is a lot of them. A lot of them. Anyways, that's my defense of Honored Heirloom. In the next video essay, I will talk about Dawn Treader Elk and how it's basically Font of Fertility and how that's basically Wayfair's Bobble. Be because those are the... Those are the other cards in the ramp package that I had to talk about real quick. They're all the same card. They just replace themselves. They hop on the board and sacrifice themselves to get a land out of the deck. Wild Growth is a one-mana enchant land card that will let it tap for an additional green. Search for Tomorrow can be played on turn one as well with its suspend cost, but otherwise it's a three-mana rampant growth that lets the card come into play untapped. Then we have Farhaven Elf, which gets a basic land from the deck onto the battlefield. Wood Elves, which gets a forest from the deck onto the battlefield. And Cultivate, which lets us get two basic lands from the deck, one onto the battlefield and one into our hand. And I honestly, I basically broke the budget by a few cents to be able to put Cultivate in because in my playtesting of Disa, the commander is so expensive that if you do not have access to lots of mana early, the deck basically folds in half and turns into a soggy hamburger. So uh, ramp is very important and we'll get into that in the upgrade section as well. But that all said, let's talk about the land base here. Because of budget reasons, the land base is running a lot of basics. We are running four mountains, we are running six forests, and we are running five swamps. Then in the dual lands section, we are running, well, Exotic Orchard is an Omni land. I labeled it wrong. That's on me. Smoldering Marsh is a searchable land, searchable in the correct scenarios, uh, but comes into play untapped. Otherwise, if we have two or more basic lands, Tainted Peak and Tainted Wood come into play untapped if we have a Swamp. Viridescent Bog, Shadowed Ridge, and Mossfire Valley are all the Odyssey Dual Lands or the Odyssey Filter Lands. Again, these are lands that I will lovingly play with in any deck that I can manage to fit them in. I think that they are fantastic, and I am so happy that we have Golgari and all the other colors for these now, finally. It took Wizards so long to do that. Cinder Glade is the other half of Smoldering Marsh, and because it has forest in its typing, our search cards that can grab a forest from the deck can actually grab Cinder Glade. They can also grab Sheltered Thicket and Canyon Slow. And I've included these in because even though I don't like tapped lands when I can help it, these do have cycling, meaning we can drop them into the graveyard at any time to power up our Tarmogoyfs. Then we have nine fetching lands because we want these lands in the graveyard to power up our Tarmogoyfs. So Evolving Wilds, of course, uh, Terramorphic Expanse as well. Both of, the, uh, both of these, as well as Escape Tunnel, are just basic tap it, sack it, get a basic land out of your library. Super easy. Myriad Landscape is the same thing, but it can ramp us two lands out instead of just getting one land out. River Tears Outlook uh, kills itself immediately when it touches the board, giving us a basic land. Jund Panorama and Promising Vein and Shire Terrace are all the exact same card because they get us a basic land out of the deck, or it can be an untapped land if we are already good on our colors. Twisted Landscape is one of the most fantastic new lands to come out in recent years. It is an untapped land like Shire Terrace, but it can tap without paying mana, like something like Escape Tunnel to get its stuff. And it has cycling on top of it. Just to try color decks. Tricolor decks are getting spoiled right now. Then we have an Omni land in the form of Command Tower and a Utility land in the form of Pit of Offerings, which gives us the ability to get rid of cards in graveyards to stop our opponents from winning with reanimation strategies. Because again, we need to keep those decks honest and it's perfectly reasonable to hurt them a lot. I am also a reanimation player, so I recognize that all of these strategies will be used against me in a court of law. That said, let's talk about what you would do if you had a little more money and you wanted to inject it into this deck. 
so some of these cards if you bought the Deez of Recon you already have but for a lot of them I have some very serious thoughts on how to upgrade this deck uh, many of these are what I'm running in my paper version of the deck so I am pretty sold on pretty much all of these but first of all Chainer Nightmare Adept this gives us the ability to reanimate things from the graveyard by discarding cards we can only do it once per turn but that doesn't matter because that we can do that at anybody's turn it's really, really good. Not only does this give us more access to recursive pieces, but this also allows us to get rid of Goyce from the hand and then just summon them on the board. Sakura Tribe Elder is fantastic because it will give you a creature in the grave early, triggering your Goyfs and also give you ramp. Kadama's Reach, because I mentioned the ramp problems of the deck, they need to be solved somehow. Sky Shroud Claim as well, searching your library for two forests and dropping them on the battlefield is wonderful. Chameleon Colossus is one of the most powerful changelings ever printed because it can't be blocked by black creatures and also has the ability to double its power exponentially. If you've got enough mana from your ramp engine, you can swing at some somebody with a Colossus and just go, well, if it's not blocked, I guess you die. Then we have Anger, which is wonderful for any combat-centric deck. It's also a creature that loves being in the graveyard, but I will give a bit of a warning. Anger, despite coming in the pre-con, does have some counter synergy with stuff like uh, Conspiracy or Maskwood Nexus, which was in the pre-con. Because if Anger is thrown to the graveyard, we don't get a choice with Disa on the board. We just auto-summon it. So make sure that your timing of stuff is more on point than mine. Ripples of Undeath is also amazing. At the beginning of our pre-combat main phase, we mill three cards. We can pay a mana and three life to draw one of those cards if we choose, but alternatively, just letting things touch the graveyard for our commander is fine. Mazzolini the Great Door is really, really powerful, and oh man, when did that become more expensive? I used to be able to put this in basically every single budget deck, but now it's $1.10? Yeah, well, good cards are going to price creep, I guess. Anyway, Matsalani allows us to draw a card, discard a card, or transform it into the core, which gives us X mana of any one color, where X is the number of permanents in our graveyard. This is one of the most fantastic ways to not only get Goyps in the grave and revive them with Visa, but once we are well established, turning it into the core and giving us access to all of that extra mana. Uh, it makes us a target for Bajukabog, but that's entirely fine. Then we have Growing Rites of Itlamok. It touches the board and lets us grab a creature from the top of our deck, while also being a Gaia's Cradle on the backside if we flip it. Again, the deck really wants these cards that tap for big mana because Disa is a huge target for removal. Then we have Realm Walker, another creature that is basically a Tarmogoyf and lets us cast Tarmogoyf from the top of our deck. Toxic Deluge lets us get rid of a ton of things on the board and it's getting less and less expensive every single day. Reach the Multiverse is a wonderful haymaker in the deck and if you're running the pre-con, this is a great thing to replace your Deathbridge chant with. Not only does it make everybody mill 10 cards, which can spawn a lot of Goyfs on our board for a winning turn, but for every player, we then take a creature from their graveyard or a planeswalker from their graveyard and put them on the battlefield under our control. We turn them into Phyrexians afterwards, but that doesn't really matter. The point is, if you play a Breach the Multiverse with an Anger in the graveyard while Deeth is on the board, you basically win the game. Because if you're hitting three or four creatures, you'll be able to revive all of those with Disa, and then you'll revive an extra card from your graveyard because of Breach, and then three more creatures from everybody else's graveyard afterwards. It would be very difficult for you not to win a game just off of this. Speaking of the pre-con, Barogoyf was in the pre-con, but if you don't have the pre-con, then you should get a Barogoyf. Death Touch, Life Link, uh, anytime it deals damage to a player, you mill that many cards and put a creature card from among them into your hand. This just gets through your deck super easy. Dare Trevor is also great. Power and toughness equal to the number of non-basic land cards in your opponent's graveyards. It's also got Suspend. You can use this to blow up important lands that are causing you trouble if you need to. Otherwise, it's another Goyf. Archon of Cruelty was in the pre-con, and I think he's only usable if you are running multiple copies of things like Maskwood Nexus. We currently have three effects that I know of that do the Maskwood Nexus effect. One of them is in this deck already. Maskwood Nexus you probably own if you got the pre-con, and Ashes of the Fallen is the harder to get card right now. Choose a creature type, every creature in your graveyard becomes the creature type. This will not give you the ability to trigger things like Pyrogoyf off of your Ashes of the Fallen, but it will give you the ability to re-summon all of your little goyfs. 
Then we have Liliana the Veil, another uh, Planeswalker you can add to the deck. Wonderful because we can make people sacrifice creatures or we can make ourselves discard a Goyf. Nether Goyf is very expensive, but for one mana, it can get on the board really quick. And otherwise, it's just another Karma Goyf that has escape. Tortured uh, Existence is one of the super powerful cards to add into the deck. It's raised in price a lot since this deck was printed. We can choose and discard any card in our hand or a creature in our hand to get a creature from our graveyard back to our hand. This allows us to get rid of all the goifs in our hand and put other live cards back into our hand immediately, giving us almost perpetual access to good board presence. It's also a wonderful way to circumvent commander tax by just getting rid of dead cards in our hand and getting our commander back to our hand from our grave instead of letting it hit the command zone. Tarmogoyf is a flavor choice. If you want Tarmogoyf in your deck, you've already bought one, but I don't have one in mind because I don't feel the need to spend $15 on a token, but you do you. Greater Good is probably one of the best additions you can search for in the deck, period, though. With its ability to sacrifice a Goyf, which will usually be between three and eight power, to draw cards equal to their power and then discard three cards, you're going to use this to get rid of any dead cards in your hand or get rid of Goyf's that Disa will summon. If Anger's already in your grave, Greater Good can actually be used as a straight up win con with Disa on the board. Scenario, you've got Maskwood Nexus and Greater Good on the board and Disa on the board. You use Greater Good, you sacrifice any creature on your board, draw, say, five cards. Then you discard three creatures. Those three creatures are Tarmogoyfs because of the Maskwood Nexus. They pop onto the board, and now suddenly you've got three more creatures. Sacrifice one of them to draw five or six more cards, and then discard three more creatures, getting three more creatures onto the board. Eventually, you'll get through almost your entire deck, and as long as Anger's in your graveyard, then you've got the ability to just swing out for game, period. Uh, with the amount of evasive creatures in the deck, with the average power level of the creatures in this deck, it's super easy to get a damn near lethal board state off of greater good. But after that, uh, I would get these. These are the new Surveil lands, and some of them are a little pricey, and I'm not super happy about that. But while I normally would not recommend a bunch of lands to put into a deck, because as far as I'm concerned, land base is important, but not as important as people's wallets seem to think they are, these cards serve a wonderful purpose in our deck. Not only is it super important to have access to Surveil in a deck like this, so we can get things in the grave for the Tarmer Goyfs to care about, or get rid of Goyfs so that we can summon them to the board, but these are searchable with things like the Wood Elves that, uh, and the Binding of Old Gods, which are already in the $15 version of this deck. Having these things be searchable is fantastic, and if you've got fetch lands already lying around from your buying of copious amounts of Modern Horizons 3 products, then maybe add a couple of those in here as well. One of the best turn one plays you can make is just playing a fetch land, cracking it, and getting one of these on the board, and then sending something from your deck to the graveyard, or making sure that the top card of your deck is live. This can make sure that Goyfs will always be online, even after you've done things like lose your graveyard to a Bajukabog, or our own mending of Dominaria. I think these lands are fantastic, and I'm so glad that everybody likes them. I just wish that they weren't as expensive as they were. But that's about it for deck upgrades. How do I feel? about this thing. Holy shit, this deck is so fun. Holy shit, this deck is so fun. Oh my, okay. So I've been trying to be more objective about this deck as I go, more descriptive, but I'm just going to gush now. This has been one of the most fun decks I've had in a while. The pre-con felt a little janky. I'm not going to lie, but it still felt really, really good to play, even if the jank was there. I completely disagree with what the Talarian Community College professor said about this. I think Disa is a wonderful commander, and I think the deck was entirely on the right track with value stuff in play. There are some clunky cards in there that really needed some replacements, but as I've elucidated here, I've already done all of that work. I play a full power version Sans Ashes of the Fallen deck, in uh in actual paper just because i can't find an ashes of the fallen anywhere and trust me i looked around 
I can order one from TCG Player if it comes to that, but I literally went across the United States looking for a copy of this thing. It, well, more of us. I went politically canvassing up in New York, and I live in Atlanta, Georgia, so I went to a bunch of card shops between here and New York City and in Philadelphia in a desperate attempt to find Ashes of the Fallen, and I wasn't able to. But as even without it, with just Conspiracy and Maskwood Nexus, it is enough for the deck to feel buttery, buttery smooth. It is so fun to just drop a shit ton of little Tarmogoyfs on the board and just start ramming them at people over and over again at high speeds, and you don't even care how many of them die. In my version of the deck, I'm running a Tribute to the World Tree and an Elemental Bond and Garrick's Uprising and the uh, the Garrick's Pack Leader that I mentioned here, and also, uh, what, I can't even remember what else I mentioned, just like all of the little, I do a thing, I draw card cards. Oh, and Greater Good, that's the other one, and Greater Good. And so, like, once the deck goes online, it's very, very hard to stop me from just having a perpetually full hand filled with stuff to do. And a lot of times, uh, what I would do just uh, the last time I played it in our casual tournament up at the card shop, I would just draw a shit ton of cards and then sit on them. Pass my turn, discard my hand down, and go, now that I've discarded my hand down, here's my boatload of triggers that happen because Deese is reviving everything I discarded. That means I've kept all the removal in my hand and it's all instant speed. Let's go, motherfucker. <laughs> like, that's kind of where I've been with this commander. She is so, so fun to play and just playing her as this really evasive glass cannony strategy is super fun. You don't run a lot of protection, you just accept that you're gonna have your strategy shattered and then you're gonna rebuild it over and over again. And it always feels great to do it. it the look on somebody's face the minute that I go and I spawn six Tarmogoyfs and they're like, wait, that's not how the card works. And then suddenly they look at first strike and go, oh, that's exactly how that card works. And just, you get that field full of things and then you draw your six cards and then you just sit there. You feel like a super villain that just assembled all the pieces. But the pieces were like two cent cards nobody cares about that just did their job well. Anyway, I'm, I'm going off the rails. I love this deck. And I think if you haven't given it a shot yet, pick up the pre-con and give it some of the upgrades that I've given here. I found that doing pre-con upgrade videos doesn't really perform very well on my side of the internet. So instead of doing that, I'm gonna make $15 versions of those. I did it with Aslask. I did the combined video with Satya because I think that I thought that was a lot more fun and interesting than just doing a pre-con upgrade. And Disa doing the $15 version, I it's, it's more my style, it's more my speed. But I do still recommend, if you want to play this commander, either get the $15 version that I've made here, or just get the freaking pre-con from your local LGS. It's one of the less expensive ones out of the bunch for Modern Horizons 3. I will say, though, as I've said in previous videos, if you are buying any of the decks that I've made here, what you want to do is not buy one. You want to buy about three or four at the same time. This is because oftentimes budget cards come from vendors that have obscure collections and they always have a dollar shipping on stuff from TCG Player. Or you pay like $55 getting it from Card Kingdom, which defeats the entire purpose. If you are buying from these vendors, their collections are often expansive enough with obscure cards that if you are buying multiple decks, oftentimes you will find that a lot of the cards that you are buying end up being from similar vendors. And the cart optimizer on TCG Player will basically force everything for you. So instead of spending 40 or $50 on one of these decks because it's $15 in cardboard and then 35 on shipping, just pick up three or four of them. So you're spending $60 on four decks worth of cardboard and probably the exact same amount of shipping like, if you get more cardboard, you get more decks to play with, more stuff to mess around with that way. And I think, honestly, one of the benefits of budget decks is that it is easier to build multiple decks. If any of you have, like, a very small magic collection due to budget, and you've got a little bit of money to splurge, but you don't know what to spend it on, I the best thing you can do, honestly, is just... Find a few of the $15 decks that I've made here that speak to you and pick up a lot of them at the same time on TCG Player. 
that will lower their cost significantly per piece of cardboard per unit of shipping as long as you're using the cart optimizer but also be a little wary sometimes the card optimizer gets a little funky and tries to add in like a ten dollar foil version of a card so just be a little careful with it maybe i should do a video on how to use the card optimizer properly for actually saving money but either way I think you're going to enjoy this deck a ton. I, I love Disa. Her deck has been super fun, and I need to do an upgrade path for the Satya Precon as well uh, in, in a similar version here. Maybe it'll just be like a full power Satya or something. I don't know. Let me know what you think in the comment section below, what you think I probably should do. I'm, I'm going to get out of your hair. Thank you for listening to me just ramble on at the end of this video. I needed a little bit of joy after uh, recent events that happened over last weekend. You, you know what I'm talking about. As always, everybody, insert end of video tagline here. Hey, I just quickly want to give a thank you to all of my wonderful patrons who keep this show running. YouTube and Twitch are a pretty bumpy ride at the best of times, and the stability a Patreon provides me is worth more than I can say here. I'd also like to thank each and every one of my $20 and up patrons here. They would be Red Joker, Britzkrieg, Cameron, Dren, Gemshin, Smiling DM, Poundini, Mabity Babity, Naomi, Isaac, Agamotto, Jordan, Ravi, Juni, Kiratorian, Prisma, all of you, Sagitta, I'm not saying that part, and Starlight. And finally, thank you to everyone else that helps keep this channel alive. While you're here, why not check out another video? And thank you for watching.